Okay, so Eliezer is going to come up and talk about the challenges of friendly AI. So a, uh, before I start, a, a quick comment. Uh, someone uh, reproached, reproached me today and said, I understand that you're a creationist. And I said, what? And they said, well, you were talking yesterday about um, how it was impossible to evolve a butterfly. And I said, no, not impossible. Just amazing that it happened at all. I mean, uh, so I just want to disclaim that not a creationist. <laughs> butterflies evolved. <laughs> Um, it's just an extremely inefficient way to make butterflies. <coughs> okay, so, um, oh, and this is uh, going to be a bit of, uh, you know, like far future speculative type stuff, which I make no apologies whatsoever for. Thank you. <coughs> oh, and uh, one last thing um, about the, uh, uh, um, these singularitarians. Um, I don't think I've ever actually met one who said these things, but that's just me. <coughs> So, let's say that you, a human being, are offered a million dollars to win a chess game. One way you could try to win is by playing the chess game yourself. But what if you have to play a thousand chess games? Playing a thousand chess games is a lot of work. Laziness is one of the great virtues of a computer programmer. If you're lazy, then you might write a computer program, a Nero AI, to play chess for you. This is a lot more work than playing a single, chain, a single game of chess. Laziness is usually more work than hard, uh, than hard work. Um, but you only have to write the program once. How can you write a program to play chess? Could you imagine every possible chess board and program in what you think is a good move for that position? Unfortunately, there's an exponentially vast space of possible chess positions. You need to save yourself some work here. You need to be lazy. You'll have to solve the problem on a higher, more general level than recording moves and playing them back. But wait a minute. How do you, a human, know which move to make in a position? Did your DNA pre-program you with all possible chess positions? By asking yourself, wait a minute, how did I decide to make that move? You realize that you have some criterion for judging your moves. and Asking how did I judge uncovers opportunities to be lazy, to create a system that solves the problem on a higher level, to compress the problem using one algorithm instead of lots of little pre-programmed moves. In chess AI, the key idea is search. The criterion of a good move is that it leads to checkmating the opponent. The good move is the one that steers the future of the chessboard. <clears throat> steers away from futures where the opponent checkmates you and steers toward futures where you checkmate the opponent. By searching the game tree, we find moves that are likely to fit this criterion. Consider Deep Blue, the chess playing program that beat Kasparov for the world championship. If Deep Blue's programmers had tried to program Deep Blue explicitly, tell it exactly which moves to make, then Deep Blue could never have played better chess than its programmers. So the programmers told Deep Blue what the consequence of its moves should be and Deep Blue calculated which moves had which consequences. Deep Blue could search deeper than its programmers, so it could better foresee the consequences of a chess move, so it played, jetter, so it played better chess, bearing in mind that it had the right criterion of what it was searching for. Building a bulldozer is more difficult, requires a higher level of technology than shoveling dirt yourself. But a bulldozer can lift things too heavy for human muscles. By the power of laziness, you can do things that would be impossible with mere hard work. <clears throat> you may recall from uh, yesterday's talk that one of the three major schools of singularity thought, Werner Vinge's Event Horizon, talks about the unpredictability of a world containing minds that are smarter than you. Deep Blue's programmers couldn't predict exactly which chess move Deep Blue would make during its tournament against Kasparov, if the programmers could have predicted Deep Blue, they would have been world champions themselves. So if you can't predict Deep Blue's moves, why not just use a random move generator? The unpredictability of a superior intelligence is not quite like the unpredictability of flipping a fair coin. The programmers couldn't predict Deep Blue's exact moves, but they could predict the consequence of Deep, Blue, Deep Blue's moves, which was that Deep Blue would win the chess game. We never bother to run a computer program unless we don't know the output, but we know some important fact about the output. 
The programmers couldn't guess the result of the search, but they understood the search. Um, writing a chess program is a lot of work. If you're really lazy, you might try to write a programming in AI that would write the chess program for you. Of course, as usual with laziness, this is much more difficult than writing the chess program yourself. It's a completely different kind of AI. One kind of AI program is about chess, and the other AI program is about programs. So you have to move to a completely different domain and solve a completely different kind of problem to make this programming AI. Laziness often involves jumping up a level. It's a different kind of problem to build a build bulldozer than to shovel dirt. Um, and modern AI technology is, is not very good at this. But humans can do it. Humans can write computer programs. And therefore, we know that it is physically possible for a cognitive system to solve this problem, to exhibit this behavior of programming. Whatever humans do is possible for a cognitive system. A truly lazy AI researcher should have a reflex whenever they think about a problem that says, how am I thinking about this problem? Could I get an AI to think this way? You may not always be able to answer the question, but you should always ask it. If you don't ask unanswerable questions, you'll lose track of the important research problems and lose track of what you don't know. It's a lot of work to figure out how to write a programming AI, and it's so difficult that modern AI science is still working on it. Suppose you're really, really lazy. Then you might think, where does AI theory come from? I'll symbolize AI theory using the deservedly popular textbook, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. Where did the knowledge in this book come from? From humans such as Peter Norvig. Human AI researchers wrote papers, thought about algorithms, carried out computational experiments, argued heatedly about the nature of intelligence. Since humans can do this kind of cognitive work, it must be physically possible. Maybe I can write an AI which thinks about AI theory for a while, does, maybe does some experiments, and then outputs an AI textbook. This is going to call, take a whole new kind of AI, what you might call an AI theory AI. And modern AI science does not even begin to approach this kind of ultra-high level reasoning. It may seem so abstract and airy that you wonder if it's a real problem. But this reflects our own lack of knowledge. The challenge is real. We just understand it poorly. Humans do think about AI theory. And an AI that can't think about AI theory will be below us. There will be thoughts we can think that it can't. So the obvious next question is, if you're really, really, really lazy, then what kind of AI do you need to write an AI theory AI? But here, one strongly suspects that an AI that can output artificial intelligence a modern approach will, if you run it long enough, output itself. If human AI researchers can th create an AI that thinks about AI theory at least as well as human AI researchers, that AI should be able to swallow itself and become a reflective AI. And this, as you may recall from yesterday's talk, is where the intelligence explosion comes in. This is how we have the mind that improves itself, the positive feedback cycle. The AI that can make itself smarter in ways that improve its ability to make itself even smarter. The human brain is finitely complex. The brain only has so many neurons patterned by, patterned by a much smaller amount of DNA that tells it how to learn. It only takes a bounded amount of work to be ultimately lazy, to create the AI that can do everything humans can, including AI theory. It's not the last work we'll ever do, but it's the last job that we have to do whether we like it or not. Then what? One occasionally hears a line of reasoning that goes something like this. Someone says, when technology advances far enough, we'll be able to create minds far surpassing human intelligence. Now, it's clear that if you're baking a cheesecake, how large a cheesecake you can bake depends on your intelligence. A superintelligence could build, could build enormous cheesecakes, cheesecakes the size of cities. And there's only a bounded amount of work you have to do to create a self-improving AI. By golly, the future will be full of giant cheesecakes. I call this the fallacy of the giant cheesecake. You can't jump from capability to actuality without considering the necessary intermediate of motive. So what will an AI's motives be? That's the $64 quadrillion trick question. In Hollywood movies, all the AIs are the same type, a single tribe. Asking what AIs will do is a trick question because it implies that AIs form a natural class. Humans do form a natural class because we all share the same brain architecture. We all have a visual cortex, frontal cortex, limbic system, and so on. But the phrase artificial intelligence actually refers to a la vastly larger space of possibilities than when you say human. 
When we talk about AIs, we are really talking about 